Well, here we are in November. Can you believe in just another month or so we could say bye bye to 2023? It is hard to believe, but we are here and it's time for community. Hi, I'm Pete Gallivan. Welcome to Community. And I'm Claudine Ewing. November is Native American Heritage Month. Yeah, and you know, about two years ago, there was a major investigation uh, launched by the federal government into Indian residential schools and the trauma that it has caused over generations. Well, now there hasn't been any concrete legislation, but there is a renewed interest in heritage and pride. This means the absolute world to me. For the first time ever, the purple and white Hiawatha belt flag of the Haudenosaunee flies over Niagara Square. In a ceremony earlier this month, Native culture took center stage from opening prayers in traditional language to ceremonial dancing. Today, as we gather here, I just want us to think what this flag raising means. It means that today we are taking one more step closer towards indigenous visibility. It is a reminder that we are still here. It's also an indication that even though no concrete legislation has been adopted as a result of the Department of Interior's investigation into the Indian Residential School Program, it has nonetheless had an impact. It honestly just opens up the conversation. A lot of times these things go un undiscussed in the community and that just, you know, it lends a hand to just a lot of hurt and a lot of a lot of trauma that doesn't lend to public displays like this, right? Public displays of pride. You know, in those schools, people were not uh, proud to be who they were. If they spoke their culture, if they spoke their language, if they celebrated their culture at all, they were punished for it. It has had a lot of people talking about their experiences and reclaiming their culture. This is the first time the Haudenosaunee flag has flown at Niagara Square, and awesome. this is not something uh, that my parents had seen in their lifetime. So I'm. I'm incredibly proud. In the meantime, on the other side of the border, the Pope has visited to apologize for the past, and the Canadian government has committed $2.8 billion in reparations. Does it get frustrating that things aren't moving as quickly on this side? Uh, very frustrating, you know, because like I've said, and what I teach in my class, you know, Native people were very resilient, were very strong. We survived uh, this convoluted history that we have with the United States, but we've never healed from that. Dean Seneca teaches coursework in indigenous health disparities at UB and says that as a people, Native Americans are at a crossroads. Many look at the progress made in Canada and say, why isn't more being done here? While at the same time, the Interior Secretary, Deb Holland, is a Native American and he sees a reluctance from many tribal leaders to push her because they don't want to make another indigenous person look bad finding out exactly what happened at these boarding schools regarding this unmarked grave issues will help us move forward in our healing. Bruce Wallace is the Native American Resource Coordinator for Buffalo Public Schools. He's also a member of the Uncachog Nation on Long Island. Little by little, steps are happening, things are changing, and hopefully we can have some policies and laws here change that will be more beneficial to our students. The Buffalo Public Schools Chief Academic Officer Ann Botticelli says one thing that is changing is the way Native history is taught. We think it's important that everyone is aware of not only local history, but the important cultures that have developed and, and created the United States. And the Haudenosaunee are obviously a part of that. In recent years in particular, since the issue of Indian residential schools was thrust into the public awareness, the curriculum has changed in Buffalo schools, even incorporating portions of the 2021 Two On Your Side documentary, Tragic Legacy. We have a culturally and linguistically responsive initiative across the district, and as part of that, we also want to raise awareness about the boarding schools and the experiences students had, but also the beautiful Haudenosaunee culture. Check this out. There was a big announcement at the 2023 Buffalo Urban League Gala. The Buffalo Urban League plans to build on Jefferson Avenue. The $25 million, 40,000 square foot building will house the Urban League's headquarters and other programs. Grant money and a soon to be launched capital campaign will fund the East Side building. The historic civil rights organization is dedicated to economic empowerment, equality and social justice.
Life, Master Harold and the Boys is a Tony-nominated play. It is a coming-of-age story taking place in South Africa in 1950. Apartheid is the law of the land. A white South African is trying to navigate a difficult relationship with his father. A beautiful friendship develops with the two black workers, but racism rears its ugly head. The message I want people to take away when they come to see Master Harold and the Boys is that um, although um, these topics about uh, uh, race or racism are never explicit. They have such a deep effect even when, they're, um, even when they're unspoken. Love can grow in dark places, says director Aaron Mays, born and raised in Buffalo, a Da Vinci High grad. I actually got into theater um, here in Buffalo. I was uh, uh, in some community productions. I moved to Chicago in 2003 to go to Northwestern University. And now I'm back um, to do Master Hero and the Boys as a director. Uh, I've been in theater for uh, professionally since well, 2013. After college, I got the opportunity to work as an assistant director for uh, a play by August Wilson called Seven Guitars at Court Theater. Um, and that's kind of where it all started from there professionally. Winner of two Artie Awards, and now he's back. It's always home, no matter where I go. Uh, in the world, whether it's New York or if it's overseas, Buffalo's always going to be the place where uh, my roots are. Um, and I, uh, when I got the, the, the phone call from the um, artistic director at the time, Kate Lacanti, asked me if I wanted to direct Master Harold and the Boys, it was an absolute yes. It's one of my favorite plays. It's an it's a international gem. It still speaks to so much of, uh, of our humanity when it comes to race, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to how you navigate um, uh, these difficult conversations when it comes to alcoholism, when it comes to racism. Um, um, how do you still find love in a place where it feels like uh, things are so loveless? His message to young students of color in the arts? You know that uh, your dream never has to be small. Um, I never thought I would be able to uh, do this work in the arts. I never thought I'd have the opportunity to really have such an impact. Um, but I had parents and a family uh, and friends who believed in me, and so they made sure that my dream never stayed in a box. The show runs through December 3rd at the Irish Classical Theater. Coming up on Community, men, we hear you and we see you. And we are going to look into Men's Health Awareness Month. Welcome back to Community. Well, one subject that has occupied conversation in the community is the billion dollar project to cap the Kensington Expressway. What do the neighbors think? We talked about this last month, but this conversation is continuing. Here's our Nate Benson. The word reconnect has been a common thread for the last two years. We're gonna reconnect, reunite, reunite the neighborhoods. We're talking about reconnecting neighborhoods. Fundamentally reconnecting the former hum Humboldt Parkway. And this is going to reconnect the community in amazing ways. We want to reconnect the communities. But a growing number of residents in the neighborhood near the Kensington Expressway say otherwise. I think that it is a bait and switch because how can you eliminate the toxic fumes, the dust particles, without really taking a look at the issues that, are, that have been happening for the last 60 years. I have concerns about how a billion dollars of our money is being spent. That is the first definite proposal in this 10 years that this has been ongoing. The state must slow down. If a state agency can nullify the State Environmental Quality Review Act on this project, there is no longer in the environmental law for anybody in this state. I want my rights. <laughs> Assembly Majority Leader Crystal People Stoke speaking for the first time with two on your side since the renewed public debate over the project. She echoed the sentiment of the DOT in Senator Kennedy's office. So if, if people decide that this is what they want, they don't want this to happen, then let the money go somewhere else because there is other places they can go. Gina Davis was frustrated when the DOT and state lawmakers said if the tunnel doesn't happen, the money would be moved elsewhere. Don't threaten us and say, if we don't go along with the project, you're going to take the funding away. Listen to what we're saying. We're just asking you. 
to come together with us again. As the time has run out for the public to comment, the DOT continues with their timeline. The Federal Highway Administration and state DOT will decide to move forward with their $1 billion tunnel or decide to do nothing. That decision will be made by the end of the year. But that doesn't mean the billion dollars would need to leave Buffalo, as suggested by the DOT or other state lawmakers. A source with direct knowledge of the situation explained that the governor made the decision to dedicate the funding for the project using $1 billion of the $32 billion five-year capital plan the DOT released earlier this year. There is also no hard timeline for this project that has to be met. According to the source, the DOT could move that funding to their TIP account and hold it until a decision is made, just like the funding for the Skajakwood Expressway was moved in 2019. So if the funding was removed from Buffalo for the Kensington project, it would be the governor who made that decision. November is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, a subject that is of great concern in the black community. The numbers lay it all out. African American men have the highest rate of prostate cancer. One in six black men will develop it in his lifetime compared to one in eight men overall. Black men are 1.7 times more likely to be diagnosed with and 2.1 times more likely to die from prostate cancer than white men. That is one reason Roswell Park held this early detection event earlier this month at Keybank Center. We take this away from the hospital atmosphere into more of, uh, you know, um, uh, like an arena, you know, um, so adding a, a little bit of fun, if we can say that to it try to reduce the stress as much as we can. Dr. Ahmad Ali, a urologist at Roswell, explained what happens at the screening. The screening tools that we currently have include the physical examination, which is the digital rectal examination, uh, feeling whether the prostate feels normal or if there is any areas that can kind of, that uh, might be a, a little suspicious. Uh, in addition to the prostate-specific uh, antigen, the PSA test. And by the way, PSA test was actually discovered at uh, Roswell Park. If prostate cancer is suspected, you'd probably need a prostate MRI and then maybe a biopsy. Dr. Ali says biopsies are now targeted, which means they're better at detecting cancers that might need treatment. Earlier stage patients can be offered depending on, um, their, depending on the risk, depending on what we find on the biopsy, can be offered just what we call active surveillance, just watching the cancer. And this has been proven to be very safe in numerous studies. He says events like this get people talking about prostate cancer, and if more people talk about it, more people get screened. Have you heard of John Legend? Do you know about his ties to Buffalo? Yeah, I think I've heard of him. But anyway, his connection to Buffalo is actually giving new Americans a helping hand right here at home. I cut this one. This piece is I am cut. Okay. Like the design is like I cut. The I wings. Cut. Yes. Yeah, those are the wings. Yes. Yeah. Each dove ornament featured in John Legend's Holiday Etsy shop takes Palawasha Bazir about four hours to make. She was selected to be part of his latest Etsy creator collab. I told for my daughter, so you know, the John Legend, uh, so um, support my Etsy, like my bird. So she say, why John Legend? So I say, to, uh, you are searching for YouTube and Google. So she search, oh, mom, this is, uh, he's very good singer. The dove ornaments are so popular, they're sold out. Bazir is busy making more. She's worked at Stitch Buffalo for about four years after moving here from Afghanistan as a refugee. A lot of friends here, uh, Sherry, Don, like other people, Muna, Munawara. Pakistani. We call it our dove here. Don Hogue is the founder and executive director of Stitch Buffalo. It's a nonprofit where refugee women artists make and sell their creations. Hogue says John Legend works with Nest, an organization similar to Stitch Buffalo. They reached out to Stitch Buffalo and said, do you have any women from Afghanistan that would like to become part of our Uplift Makers program? And that was the opportunity to, for them to launch their own businesses on Etsy. Not only do they build their business skills, they build their confidence, and it's another source of income for them uh, to be able to share what they make. While Bazir's Dove is sold out for now, she has many other items on her Etsy page. You can find links in this story online. Veterans Day is also in November. Coming up on Community after the break, a salute to local veterans.
opportunity um, to recognize veterans from the beginning of this country and veterans that are serving today. Nowadays, we may take mail delivery for granted, but back in the Second World War in the 1940s, it was crucial to the morale of the men and women on the front lines who were overseas especially. And that's why we're learning more today about a special lady being honored. She was a member of a special unit in World War II. Her name was Indiana Hunt Martin, and her unit as a private in the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, or WACS, was the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion, which as the first African-American women's unit sent to Europe, actually processed and routed the mail to an estimated 7 million American soldiers and sailors and other personnel serving in Europe during World War II. It was not an easy time for young black women with discrimination and harassment. That's what she said. She wanted to do what she could to help the war effort. So that's why they all joined. Plus, they all wanted to make sure that everyone understood that they loved this country just like everyone else. Janice Martin says she recently visited Scotland, England, and France, where her mother processed the mail. They didn't feel that their service was really an important job. They just knew they had two years of backed up mail that they had to go through. And when they arrived, it was like 10 airplane hangers full of mail, and everything was precision. And they knocked off all that mail in three months. And despite her later work with the state labor department, Hunt Martin, until her death at age 98 in 2020, often stopped by this Central Park Post Office branch on Manhattan Avenue, which is now named in her honor as a fitting tribute, just as her wartime mail unit is now featured in a Netflix movie and a Broadway play. Mail in her was inseparable. And we want to give a special shout out to a young lady. Etheria Ware turned 100 on November 24th. Long before the term community activist, she was pushing for a better community, especially in the Fruit Belt. She once served as president of the Fruit Belt Neighborhood Block Club. She also received the Certificate of Excellence from the City of Buffalo for Keep Western New York Beautiful. She was also the Stanley Lady selling Stanley Home products. 100 years and still vibrant. You know what? A lot of great things come out of the West Side. He must be talking about himself, <laughs> but I'm talking about Ballistic Man. He is a rapper. He is a singer. He is a producer. He's doing it all, and he's doing it for the hometown. From all the fame I see, they envy. Up early, breathing heavy on the mic like Charlemagne and DJ Envy. Ballistic Man, hip-hop artist from Buffalo's West Side. Just a regular dude at the end of the day, regular guy. But, you know, I just happen to do movies, music. And that music game has him collaborating with big names. Just recently collaborated with DJ Khaled and Fat Joe, um, guys like Benny the Butcher, Conway the Machine, which are also from Buffalo, New York. It's the general, you just another soldier. You don't want this rubbish shoulder, nah. just do like your mother told you. Um, it's just about staying persistent and being disciplined and um, just knowing that things don't happen overnight. Yeah, swear to God I work so hard for this. It's just a song about just staying persistent and how things don't happen overnight. You got, you got to work hard for it. You know, that's the name of the song, Work Hard For This. How much of an influence has Benny the Butcher and West Side have those guys been in Conway? Yeah. Um, because it just seems <clears throat> like they blew up. Griselda yeah. blew up. Mm -hmm. And after that, you can listen to Sway in the Morning, and yeah. they're talking about these Buffalo guys who are big time rappers. They're, they're the definition of staying, staying persistent and, and not stopping. Why do you want to do it? I do it mostly for the passion. I just like making, I like making music that I like to listen to and I put it out, you know, hoping that other people like it too. What's your life been like? My life's been crazy. I done been through it all, you know, from the streets to prison to working jobs. But music has saved him. And I was able to still stay focused and make it through and get this far, you know, with no handouts, with no, just grind, persistence and dedication. His advice for the youth today? They got to find something that they're passionate about, that they believe in. I just appeared in a movie called The Puppet Man. Why should this community support you? My father, he was part of the Grease Pole Festival um, for 20 years. He still is part, he still greases the pole. Um, I've been around, I'm, I'm, I'm Buffalo all the way. I bleed Buffalo.
He's found a niche in fashion. It's my boy Jimmy Scott Jr. He's wearing my um one of my hoodies from my, my neighborhood, the brand, which I'm wearing right here as well. Um, and the neighborhood just is a, a brand. It's more like a family. You know, it's more like a culture, a family. So the neighborhood I created because Buffalo, we from the city of neighbors, and I wanted to bring that worldwide. Buffaloes are the only groups of herd and mammals that if they see a storm, they actually run towards the storm compared to the other animals that run from the storms. And I feel like I've been just facing my storms all my life and running towards them. So that's kind of the meaning of the neighbor herd. Neighbor herd. From your heart, why are you thankful? I'm thankful for waking up every day. I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for another day of freedom. I'm thankful for the smallest things in life. Like I'm really simple. He says if you have a dream, chase it. It will come true. You know, every year the Saturday after Thanksgiving means one thing, get your boogie shoes on. I'm going to have my shoes on this year. <laughs> I'm going to do it up just a little bit, just a little bit. But we want to know more about the disco because it's not just about the dancing, it's to support a big cause. Is this really the world's largest disco? Uh, as far as we know, the record was set back in 1979 when the original world's largest disco was held in Buffalo and people came from all over the world to come and we decided to revive it 15 years later. So we've been having this since 1994. It's a Saturday after Thanksgiving, so you know, Wednesday night, it's the biggest bar night of the year. Thursday, people with their families. Friday, they're with their families looking for something to do. And Saturday, they have cabin fever. And I think people like to dress up. It's an incredible people-watching event. What's a good outfit? Uh, that's in the eye of the beholder. So <laughs> I, I, I won't get into that. All I would tell people is make sure you bring a comfortable pair of shoes because this concrete floor will uh, take the life out of you. And really, I mean, if you're coming to a disco, you're coming to have a good time. Absolutely. So people sing, you can, you'll hear cheering when certain songs play. And people want to hear the song the way it was, you know, on the radio in 1970 or 80 or, you know, any time in that time period. You bring in celebrities. Is that part of the draw? Yes, we tried to, we, we, we initially had all 70s celebrities, and as they have kind of aged out, uh, most of those people are in their 80s now, so it makes it very difficult to travel, and trying to get them to come to Buffalo, New York, uh, the day after Thanksgiving is not an easy task. So we have some celebrities from the 70s, and then some celebrities that are really kind of pop celebrities, pop icons, people that, if you're 25 years old and you attend, because that's the next wave of people, people that watched their parents go to this 30 years ago, they're now going, and sometimes their parents are still coming too. Is the dance really good? Uh, it's pretty good. You can tell the difference between the older people and the younger people because unfortunately the older people seem to dance a little bit better. Oh really? Is that how it works? And this is more than just a disco, right? People are coming, they're paying to come, but this money is going to a cause that is really, really important. Yep, we're 100% volunteer based, so no one involved with the event has ever been paid in 30 years. And we've given away seven and a half million dollars. And uh, the majority of the money goes to Camp Good Days and Special Times to Camp for Children with Cancer. Why? Because um, when I started dating my wife, honestly, 30 years ago, uh, I was looking to throw a party and we were gonna give some money to some charity. And uh, at the time, uh, my wife's brother passed away. His name, we share the same name, David. And uh, so I said, that was gonna be it. And we did it the first time and I went to camp. And once you start doing something for, for camp and you see the kids, it's very difficult to stop. So I feel honored and privileged to be part of it. So what do you tell people if they can't come this year, next year? Plan early. Uh, we have a waiting list. We don't have a waiting list anymore, but they can sign up for next year's mailing list. And uh, we go on sale. And I guess you have to be close to your keyboard on uh, the first the first Saturday in August. And what better way to wrap up another month here on Community than in platform shoes and bell bottoms? And a little <laughs> glitter and get your groove on. Sure. That was a song back in the 70s. I heard about that. Something like that. <laughs> we want to thank you so much for joining us on Community. Join us next month for the end of the year. Yeah. Have a great month. We'll see you next month.